Right. Now, I understand from Bill Moore and from John Porteous and others who are involved in being able to get um, Michael Hopkins to come to New Zealand that there's, there's an enormous amount of protocol to be coped with before he could become available, and this would apply to him and to his other colleagues. So there was a little note that was sent to John and to Bill, and it reads like this. It's from the United States. Congratulations on being selected to host an astronaut appearance. The Astronaut Appearance Office, the AAO, receives thousands of requests every year. Very few of these requests can be accommodated due to the support of the International Space Station and other NASA programs. So I understand that ours is one of many thousands of invitations that could be positively responded to, and thank God that was the case. On page 12 of your programs, there's a very potted bio of Michael Hopkins, and I just want to make a couple of points here. Uh, Michael is a Catholic. He spent a long time in space, and he was allowed to take with him a pix in which the Blessed Sacrament is carried, and he was able to uh, give himself communion, which, as you know, lay persons are not allowed to do. Extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist will know that. You are not allowed to self-administer the sacraments. It must be given to you. But Michael had a special dispensation. And just a little note before he comes to speak. This is his word. When I receive communion, it puts things in perspective for me. When you're in orbit and you're getting ready to go out on a space walk, from an emotional standpoint, you can be very nervous. That would be an understatement, wouldn't it? I'd be terrified. You can be afraid, if you will. So it helped the Blessed Sacrament strengthen my faith because when I was able to receive the host and realize that if my faith is strong, I have nothing to be afraid of. And that helped. He's going to speak to you. Now, I said to John, I associate two things with astronauts. A, extraordinary bravery, three things. And, and B, always they seem to me to be members of the military. And I asked John, is he, is he Army? Is he Navy? Is he Air Force? Is he Marine? Is he a da 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 da? John said, I don't know. The only way to find out is to ask him. Here's Michael Hopkins. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's quite a privilege to, to be here. Uh, before I get started, I'm going to uh, uh, ask, because uh, this one is supposed to be for the kids. Um, I'm going to be speaking tomorrow as well, but today was uh, really geared towards the kids. So if there's any other kids that are out there that are um, seated in the back, if you'd like to come up and join uh, the other kids that are here, um, I, I welcome you to come on up. Um, as I did mention, I am going to speak tomorrow. And, and so I thought today I would, excellent, there's a lot of room right over here. Um, I thought today I would focus uh, a little bit more on uh, some of the fun things about being in space, uh, some of the things that it takes to get to space, some of the things that it takes to uh, live in space that, uh, that make it a little bit different. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to focus a lot on the Eucharist and uh, my journey um, through the uh, to the Catholic faith and and just the things that happened that allowed me uh, to be able to take the host up with me. So if that's okay, John, if uh, that's uh, if I can focus today on on the kids and and some fun things about space and and uh, God's plan, um, what He has for us, uh, I'd like to do that. And then tomorrow again, I'll focus on the Eucharist. Okay, um, so for all of the kids here. Uh, if you were like me, when I was about your age, I used to dream about uh, what I was going to be when I grew up. And so if we could go to the next slide. Um, I grew up on a farm, 
and so it might be hard to see. Let me get out a, a pointer here. So I don't know if it's going to work. If you can see, that's me right there on a farm in uh, rural Missouri. And we grew, uh, we had the hogs and cattle. And uh, one of the first things I thought I might be is a rodeo cowboy. And you can see that didn't go very far. Um, and then when I was about, uh, I don't know, 10, 11, 12 years old, I thought I wanted to be a truck driver. So that was my goal. I was going to be a truck driver. Uh, some things changed, but actually, believe it or not, uh, I still want to be a truck driver, and I'm thinking that's going to be my retirement job. I've tried to convince my wife that, uh, that when we retire, we're going to sell the house, we're going to buy a big truck, and we're going to drive around the country. She's not sold on that plan yet, but we're going to keep working on her. Uh, but my goals changed a little bit as I, as I got older. And let's go to the next slide. And I decided I wanted to get into uh, flying in the military. Um, this is also about the time that I, the idea of maybe becoming an astronaut came to me. And so I ended up uh, going off to the University of Illinois and I, I joined uh, Air Force ROTC, which is the Reserve Officer Training Corps. And so I was in a program to get into the military once I graduated. Um, and so that was uh, the flying and I got to test airplanes. Uh, but eventually, uh, I still had that goal, and let's go to the next slide, of becoming an astronaut. And so after uh, 13 years, four tries, uh, NASA finally selected me to, to be an astronaut. And that was back in 2009. Um, so in 2009, the primary mission that NASA had was the International Space Station. And this is a picture of the International Space Station. Uh, the International Space Station is, uh, I normally say it's about the size of a football field, but here I'll say it's about the size of a rugby pitch, um, just to give you a sense of the, of the size of the station. If you look here in the, the middle portion, this is the pressurized module, so that's where the astronauts live. And then these parts on the outside here, these are the solar arrays, and the radiators, there's no, they're um, exposed to the vacuum of space, but that's how we get our power, and that's how we get our cooling. Now, the space station is manned, typically has six people on board. And uh, typically, that's two to three US astronauts, two to three Russian cosmonauts, and then uh, either one, uh, usually one astronaut from either Japan, from Canada, or one of our European partners. So there's actually 15 different countries that operate the International Space Station. And so again, back in 2009, I was very fortunate and I was selected uh, to be one of the, uh, the newest astronauts. Um, now, how do we get to this International Space Station? Well, we used to have a space shuttle, and that's actually how we ended up building that, uh, that space station but we retired it in 2011. And so since that time, we have gotten to the space station on board the Russian Soyuz. So it is a Russian-built rocket and a Russian-built capsule. Let's go to the, the next slide. And so this is a picture of, that, uh, of the Russian rocket. That's the Soyuz there. It actually takes off out of Kazakhstan. So Baikonur in Kazakhstan is the uh, launch complex. And uh, this capsule you can see on the very top, that is what we're actually sitting in. So if you can see that up over here, the, uh, the capsule, there's actually uh, two different, three different parts to this capsule. The center section, that's where the astronauts are. Up here is kind of a living compartment, and the, the third section on the bottom is, uh, that's where the, uh, there's a rocket motor there, there's power, uh, oxygen, things of that nature are supplied out of that. Uh, to give you a sense of how small it is, you can look at the next picture over, and there's actually three astronauts crammed in there. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty tight fit um, to get all of us in there. A uh, pretty small vehicle, but it's a very reliable vehicle. This vehicle the Russians have been launching since the, uh, the Apollo era, so back in the 60s, they've been launching this vehicle. Uh, when you go up to the International Space Station, uh, it actually only takes about nine minutes to get into space once that rocket lights. And then another six hours we dock with the station. And, uh, and then that vehicle stays docked to the station for the whole time that you're there because it's your lifeboat. But then at the end of the mission, it brings you home. 
And believe it or not, that's what the vehicle, that center section where the, the astronauts are, this is what comes back and lands on Earth. And believe it or not, that is a good landing. That's what the vehicle looks like. It, uh, it is designed to burn up a little bit as it's coming into the atmosphere, but it keeps the, the astronauts safe uh, during their return trip. So let's look a little bit deeper into uh, what it takes to launch on, on this vehicle. So let's go to the next slide. So if you can see that, I know the lighting's a little, a little hard in here, but that's uh, the spacesuit that we wear when we launch and we land in the, in the Russian Soyuz. That is what we call a pressure suit. And that suit is built for each individual astronaut. So that is my suit. Um, and what that is designed to, if when you launch, if there should be a problem with the vehicle and it should start going to vacuum, that means there's no air, this suit is going to fill up with air and it's going to keep you alive until you can get back down on Earth. And so, again, that has been custom made for you. And before you actually get to actually crawling in the rocket, you get to test it out. So let's go to the next slide. Hopefully this video is, uh, is going to work. So there's me in my, in my spacesuit, and it looks a little bit different, and that's because they've actually blown it up. And so I'm in that pressurized condition in a mock-up of the seat, and believe it or not, I'm going to sit in this seat for two hours uh, while we uh, make sure that there's no leaks and that it fits me and that it's comfortable and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so it takes a, a, a lot before you eventually get to crawl in a vehicle and, and launch into space. Now there's another interesting part about, um, about this vehicle and the suit, and we can go to the next. You notice I'm sitting in a seat pan, and that seat pan is made for me. It's molded to me. So each individual, every astronaut that, that goes into a Soyuz, they have their own individual suit, and they have their own individual seat pan. So how do they make that seat pan? Well, this is uh, some technicians over in Russia that are molding my particular seat. Now, how do they do that? Let's go to the next slide. So there I am, sitting in this mold, and they are pl pouring plaster around me. So they are actually making a mold of me, um, which is a little strange. So you can see they're holding me down as they pour this, this plaster around me uh, that then is going to be used to help design that seat. And why is that important? Well, it's important so that when we come back to land, we are uh, we're protected that there's, uh, as you hit the ground, which is a very hard landing, that there's, uh, we minimize the chance for injuries. So now they poured this plaster around me, and I don't know if you kids have ever had to get to play with plaster or anything, but eventually it needs to dry up, but we need, now they got to get me out of this without messing up the mold. So how do we do that? So let's go to the next slide. So, of course, they're going to lower a crane down, and I'm going to grab on to that a little bit lower, and then they're going to just try and pull me straight out without messing up the mold. And voila. So, <laughs> a little bit different outfit than the one I'm wearing right now, not as flattering, but, uh, but that's definitely um, one of the more interesting parts that you oftentimes don't hear about of what it takes to put someone into space. Uh, there's a lot of little details uh, that go into launching a, a person into space, and this just gives you a feel for what some of those, uh, what some of those details are. Now, let's Let's go up into space and let's see what that's like. So let's go on to the next video. Why are we up in space? Yeah, you're in microgravity. Um, this giant orbiting laboratory, the International Space Station, and the reason we use it in this, uh, is because of this microgravity environment where we can do a lot of research. But here are some astronauts and they're just having some fun. Uh, this is the way water behaves up in space. So down here, on the ground, gravity is very dominant on the water, but up in space, it's much less dominant, and so the surface tension forces of the water uh, become dominant, and you get these water balls like that, these bubbles of, of water, if you will. And so here, we're actually putting a GoPro camera inside the water, so now you can see what it looks like from the inside of a water bubble in, in space. Now, I mentioned the surface tension. If you notice, he's going to touch the water, and it almost starts to crawl up his finger as, uh, because, again, those surface tension is much more dominant in the microgravity environment. 
So this is why we're up there, is because uh, we want to understand the impacts of microgravity on the physical things around us as well as on our own bodies as well because our bodies obviously are made up of uh, a lot of fluid and uh, so it behaves differently in space as well a lot of impacts um, to us now some of the gross things about the way water behaves like this so we exercise a lot when we're in space and when we're exercising we sweat now, when you guys sweat down here, when you're running around playing basketball and doing those kind of things, the sweat just drips off you, right, and it's on the ground. Well, in space, you saw how that water kind of crawled up his finger? Well, the sweat stays on you, and it just kind of starts to build up, and it'll start filling in your ears, and then it'll start all filling in your eyes, and eventually you'll get this big ball of sweat, and it'll fling off and, and hit the walls, and it's pretty messy up there. Yeah, yeah, one of the weird things about being in space. So, because of that, though, every Saturday on board the International Space Station is cleaning day. So, <laughs> we, put down our, we put down our tools and uh, we spend the morning scrubbing the walls and, and cleaning the International Space Station. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mentioned that we normally have six people on board the International Space Station at any one time. The way we get there, you saw that Soyuz, which took three of us up. And so when I arrived to the International Space Station in September of 2013, there were already three people on board. And so we joined, they had been there for about three months. And so we joined them, and typically what happens at the end of three months, they come home, so that completes their six-month mission, and then we're joined by three new astronauts for another three months, then we come home, and that's how we just kind of continuously leapfrog crews while we're up there. In my case, uh, one thing that we did a little bit different is before the, the crew, when we first got there, before they came home, the next crew actually came up. So at one point, we had nine astronauts on board the space station. And the reason for that is, let's go to the next, the next video. Uh, here you can see the arrival of that, of that next crew. And uh, this was back in um, November of 2013. And the reason this crew came up is because if you remember in February of 2014 was the Winter Olympics. And those Winter Olympics were in uh, Sochi, so in Russia. And they brought up a torch. And so this is one of the torches that was actually used in the relay for the Winter Olympics back in 2014. And so here you see uh, Misha comes on board and he was the commander of that Soyuz. He's relaying, handing off the torch to the commander of the ISS. Uh, a little bit later, we actually had a relay uh, with all of us um, on the International Space Station. So there is a, uh, I think we started with the Italian astronaut, and then he passed to the Japanese astronaut, and then we went through the, the uh, three U.S. astronauts, or two U.S. astronauts, and then we or three U.S. astronauts, and then we passed it on to the Russian cosmonauts. So we had a little bit of a relay, and then believe it or not, the, uh, the Russians took this, uh, this torch out on a spacewalk. And so there is a shot of uh, Oleg and Sergei out on a spacewalk with the Olympic torch. And that Olympic torch, a couple days later, then came home with that crew that was rotating home. And then this torch actually was the, uh, the torch that was used for the relay coming into the, into the Olympic Stadium. So sometimes you get to participate in some very unique and uh, different uh, events on board the space station, and that certainly uh, was one of those. Okay, now, how do we get supplies up there, right? So we can't just run down to the grocery store and pick up some food or some new clothes or anything of that nature. So we have to have what we call supply vehicles. So let's go to the next, uh, the next video. And so one of those vehicles is the uh, Orbital Cygnus. And this is uh, an uncrewed supply vehicle. And so it launches, uh, in this case, it's launching from the U.S., and once it gets into space, you're going to see the picture here of that, uh, of that supply vehicle. So there it is right there. That's the Cygnus as it's approaching the International Space Station. So it's going to come up and fly in formation. And we're going to, and this is me, I'm operating a robotic arm. And I'm going to reach out with that robotic arm and grab on to that Cygnus supply vehicle. And once we then have grabbed on to that supply vehicle, uh, we will then... Uh, attach it to the station. 
And so there I am reaching out right at the, at the end of the uh, moving the robotic arm, grabbing onto it, and we had a, six, a successful capture. But I gotta tell you, that one was a little bit stressful because if you mess that up, uh, your crewmates are gonna be pretty upset with you because that's all your, uh, your food and supply. Uh, once you get it docked to the station, now you have to get the hatch open, and sometimes that's not as easy as it might seem. Uh, the vacuum of space can do some uh, strange things to the vehicles, and so in our case, there's a, uh, there's a seal around the hatch, and uh, it was still a vacuum, so it took us a while to, to be able to get the hatch open. But once you get it open, now you've got all of these supplies that have come up. Now, that's not the first thing the astronauts are going after, though. Typically, NASA allows a uh, care package to come up from your families. And so when we first get this hatch open, most of us are diving in and getting the care package, and that's what you see the three of us. And a lot of it is food that's more like what you guys are used to eating. Uh, most of our food on board is a little bit different, and so like these were fresh tortillas, fresh meaning they were probably made within the, the last week. And <laughs> let me tell you, those are the best tortillas I've ever had. Um, the other interesting one, so Rick, you see there, this was a pepper relish that his wife had sent up. He's from Connecticut, and there was a little hot dog stand near where he grew up that had this uh, great pepper relish, and his wife was able to send that up. So um, this is just a couple of hours after getting the hatch open. You can see we're enjoying, enjoying uh, the, the special treats that, uh, that came up with that. Uh, at the end of the mission, and I'll go through that in a little bit more though, we actually connect up with that robotic arm again and here we're actually releasing the vehicle and uh, what it's going to do, and I'll explain why, but it's going to come back and eventually burn up in the atmosphere when we're done. Uh, the reason for that is we generate a lot of trash on board the International Space Station. So all of our food is individually packaged and, uh, and so you know, after we eat it we throw that away um, guess what, we don't have a uh, washer or dryer on board the International Space Station. So what do we do with our clothes? Well, we wear them for a long time, usually a couple weeks, and then at the end of two weeks you throw them out. Um, so if you imagine your workout clothes, uh, for all the parents out there, imagine your kids wearing their workout clothes for a couple weeks before you got to wash them. Uh, so it tends to get a little smelly, but, but we then throw those out, right? And so do you guys have to take out the trash? Is that one of your chores, right? So for us, taking out the trash is a little bit different. And what we end up doing is we stuff it back into that supply vehicle. So all of our trash, from our food uh, to our clothes to experiments we don't need, they, go, they get stuffed back into that vehicle. And so if you will, go on to the next slide. And let's see if, that, uh, if this one works. It's, uh, you don't have to push it more than, yeah, OK. Let's click it one more time. So this is me crawling inside and filling this vehicle with trash. And so you, um, you want to get as much in there as you can. And, and so there's not a lot of room when you're crawling around in that vehicle, but that's me actually uh, filling it up with the trash. And again, what ends up happening is, as it's coming back into the atmosphere, it burns up. So that's our incinerator. That's how we take out the trash from the International Space Station. So, if you're outside one day playing and some dust is raining down on you, you never know, that might be the trash from the, uh, the International Space Station after it's, after it's burned up on, on entry. Um, okay, now, do you guys have to take a bath every night or in the morning when you first get up? Is that one of the things mom and dad? No, you don't have to? Excellent. You need to go to space then, because guess what? In space, there's no shower. Remember what the, how that water behaved in space, right? So it's, it doesn't work the way it does here. It's not gonna, the water's not going to fall around you. Uh, so we don't have a shower up there for 166 days. I didn't take a shower. Sound pretty good? <laughs> um, so what do we do instead? We actually have these uh, little towels that have uh, soap already dried into them. We'll get water on them, and then we'll just do a sponge bath. Um, but now let's talk about hair. What do we do with our hair, right? How do, you, how do you wash with shampoo when you can't pour water on it to rinse it out? Particularly for some of you uh, young girls that have this really long hair, what do you do? All right, how do we wash our hair? Well, let's go to the next video. 
So this is Karen Nyberg. She was my crewmate while I was on board the International Space Station, and she's going to show you how to wash your hair in space. So that's our water bag. Uh, we use that to drink with. We also use it when we're taking a bath. And so she's actually just pouring water around uh, on her head. And she, so she gets her hair all nice and wet. And then the next thing, and you can see, I don't know if, it's, if you can see the water bubbles that are flying off. Remember I talked about that sweat and all of that? Well, that kind of gives you a sense of what happens uh, as well. So she's put water on it, and now she is using no rinse shampoo. Believe it or not, it exists. And so on the International Space Station, we use this no rinse shampoo. So there you can see Karen, she's uh, rubbing it into her hair. And now she's using her comb to uh, make sure it gets all the way in. And then you take a towel and you just start drying off with it. Now in, in Karen's case, so that would be enough for me, uh, given the length of my hair. That's probably all I needed to do was just rinse off or just uh, use the soap and then I just use the towel. Karen actually, because of the, the length of her hair and everything, she um, would always use a little bit more water to help rinse it out. Um, but uh, again, you comb it out, dry it, and voila, you've now washed your hair in outer space. Um, so a little bit different than, than the way we do it down here on Earth, but uh, believe it or not, I think it works pretty well. Um, I don't remember smelling when I was up there. I thought I stayed pretty clean. I think most of us think we stayed pretty clean, and, uh, and so it's not too bad. All right, you guys ready? Now we're going to talk about another thing with hygiene. You know where I'm going, right, with this? Okay, so let's go to the next... Let's go to the next picture, the next slide. All right, in case you're wondering, there is the space toilet. And so what are we looking at here? What we're looking at is, uh, if you see this yellow cone up there, and it's attached to this hose. So I don't know if everybody can see that over here. Let me come over and, and point that out for you real quick. Uh, very hard to see with the lighting, but there's a yellow cone right here, and it's attached to this hose, okay? So uh, in space, we don't have a toilet that's filled with water. We've seen how water behaves in space, a little bit different, right? So it's not going to work the same. So when we urinate, when we go pee, we pee into that yellow cone. So when we open it up, we flip a switch, it turns on a fan, and it creates suction. And so that we then pee into that, uh, into that cone, and both men and women use the same, uh, the same cone, and then it goes into, back behind these panels, and I don't know if you can really see it that well, Karen's over here, she's back behind those panels, um, but back behind those panels is a recycling system. And so that pee then becomes our drinking water. Yeah, pretty wild, huh? Who wants to be an astronaut, right? Um, so we actually recycle about 80% of our water on board the, uh, the International Space Station. We get it from our urine, but we also get it from the condensation and things of that nature as well. All right, so we've talked about our pee. We've got one more thing to talk about, right? Yeah, what do we do with that? Okay. So you see this can over here? I don't know if you can, uh, if you can see that very well, but there's a, there's a can kind of at the bottom of that right-hand picture. Um, I, hopefully you guys can see it over here as well. Anyway, there's a can over there. It's got a lid on it. Um, you open up that lid, and there's a little hole, and in that hole there is a little plastic bag. And so it's kind of hard to see, but right here are some foot straps, because remember you're floating, and so you're going to put your feet in there, you're going to kind of try and aim yourself, and you're going to try and get it into that little plastic bag. Um, so when I say gravity helps, I mean it. Gravity usually does help, and up there you don't have it, so you, you tend to have to put on a glove, like a, a little plastic glove, the ones you might see your doctor use, and you kind of help things out. 
So the reality is a space flight, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, one of the amazing things about space is microgravity makes the impossible possible, right? Um, but it also sometimes makes the little things a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult to do, and this is certainly one of those things. So just in case you're curious, it takes uh, three astronauts about a week to fill up one of those cans. And then at the end of a week, you close, close the lid, seal it up, and guess where it goes? In the trash. Remember that vehicle that's bringing back trash and burning up in the atmosphere and the dust is falling down on top of you? <laughs> this is in there. <laughs> that's part of it. Um, but those, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, it's, it's one of those things that you oftentimes don't think about of how, how that actually happens, uh, how we take care of those type of things in space. And, and it's not necessarily glamorous, but uh, it, uh, it is effective and, and it gets the job done. Okay, what do you say we move on? Enough about uh, how we go to the bathroom in space, yeah? Okay, so let's, um, all right, so we're going to play a little bit of a game for the kids here. When you're up in space and you have that perspective, we're up at about 400 kilometers, right? So things look a little bit different when you're looking down from, from space. And sometimes uh, when you're looking at things, it can seem like it's something that you're seeing up close, right? So sometimes it's hard. So I'm gonna, we're going to play a little bit of a game here, and I'm going to show you some pictures. And what I need you kids to do is let me know whether you think this is a picture from something where I'm viewing it from space, or if it's something that I'm looking at really up close, like I was looking at it through a microscope. Okay, because sometimes things can look the same with your perspective. All right, so do you guys think this is a picture of something taken from outer space, or is it something that I took through a microscope looking at, at something up close? What do you think? Space. You think it's from space? How many think it's from outer space? Okay, how many of you think it's from something up close? Yeah, those are all good guesses. This is a picture of the Grand Canyon from outer space. So it's kind of weird. It can look like it's actually popping out of the page, uh, but that is the Grand Canyon, and it is going uh, into space. So let's, let's take a look at the next picture. OK, looks like another canyon, right? What do you think that is? So from outer space, how many? You think it's space? All right, how many up close? Oh, most of you think it's up close. That's a good guess. This is somebody's tooth, up close. Brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. You don't want them to have those big cracks in them like that. So that's, uh, let's take another look. See what we got here. Ooh, that looks like mold or something growing on, what do we think, outer space or up close? Space, you're thinking space? Space? Yeah, everybody's thinking space. This is actually a picture of the mountains from, from up in space. Uh, so it's pretty amazing the, the detail that you can see from, from up there. I got a couple more. Let's see what this one is. What do we think? Up close or out of space? Up close? You're right. That's a snake egg. Who knew what a snake egg looks like up close? Okay, I got one more picture for you. Let's take a look at that. Is that like, it looks like lizard skin or something, right? Out of space or up close? Space? You're good. Yeah, that's the uh, that's pictures of sand dunes in outer space. Um, it's pretty amazing to see the how the wind uh, f causes these formations in the sand, and uh, it, it's truly truly incredible to see. Um, so the views that you get from up sp in space are amazing. Let's uh, take a like I think I have just a couple more. You might know about uh, this from uh, in Dubai. The pictures there. So uh, that's what it looks like. You can see the palm trees. Uh, from outer space, and then over actually here on the on the far left, as you're looking at it, that's uh, a globe that they've made out there as well. Uh, let's go to the next one. Let's see. Yeah, you you see some pretty weird things from in space. So if you look in the upper left corner, uh, this was a formation in uh, just a rock formation in Africa, but I thought it looked like Neil Armstrong's boot print on the moon. Uh, but uh, um, and then, you know, the one on the lower right there, I'll, I'll point out as well, it looks like a, a frowny face, right? And um, that's actually a, a lake in Canada. And uh, so you, you get, uh, again, when you have this perspective from looking down at the earth from, from 250 miles, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing the things you can see. And then I got one more picture, I think. 
Let's see. Oh, no, I got a couple more. Yeah, this one was interesting. Actually, this one was uh, close to here. I'm not, I don't remember the exact island that this was where I, um, this is one you have to be careful about. So I had a, a, a Twitter account that I used when I was in space, and I would usually try and send out one a day with, um, you know, just one of the pictures I had taken, something of that nature. So I sent out this picture, and I said, hey, I, you know, today was a pretty neat day. I got to see uh, two active volcanoes. And uh, very quickly on Twitter, somebody responded and said, Mike, that's not two active volcanoes, that's one volcano with two vents. So it was smart. <laughs> When you think you know something, there's usually somebody out there that uh, is a little bit smarter than you and, and points out the errors of your, of your thinking. And that certainly was the case here. Let's go, uh, I think, one more here. So the auroras, uh, that's the northern lights. There's also the southern lights. Uh, when you see those from space, uh, boy, that never gets old when you're looking at them from above. Okay, I got one last video to show you guys. Very serious video. All right, very serious video. So let's let's roll the next one. So, <laughs> actually, not very serious. Uh, so now this is getting to have some fun in the microgravity environment. Uh, some of the things that you can that you can do when you're floating, when there's no up or down. Uh, here is uh, Steve Swanson who is snowboarding through the International Space Station, or or space boarding. I'm not sure quite quite sure what you would call that, but he's inventing a new a new sport while he is up there. <laughs> so it's not all work. Uh, we do get the weekends, usually on a Sunday uh, afternoon, you'll have some time off and, and you can see sometimes uh, you get to have a little bit of fun. Um, so Swanee does not know the force. He is not using the force. He is just using the, taking advantage of the microgravity environment. And, uh, and it makes it pretty easy for passing tools around or equipment or things of that nature. So he's going to He's going to pass it back as well. Uh, this never gets old. <laughs> 166 days up there, and this incredible environment. <laughs> and I think we're going to see one more thing here. Uh, we're going to see the backstroke as well. OK. <laughs> um, Let's go to the, the next slide. Um, so what I'd like to do now uh, is take some questions from, from the kids. I think we have some time for that. Uh, and then once, uh, when we're done with the questions, I'll, I'll just kind of leave you with, with one thought uh, for the kids, and, uh, and then we'll wrap it up from there. Does that sound, does that sound okay? Are we good on, on the timing? I think we're still good with it. So let's ask some questions. And I'll just repeat your questions, guys. So what do you got? Has anyone ever seen you on the toilet? Um, well, my mom and dad, yes, but not that one. Um, all right, so no, we have the, the toilet. There's actually a door there, and so you're able to close the door when you're using the facilities. Um, now, one of the interesting things I would tell you is, remember how I talked about uh, when, you, when you had to go number two? and use that little plastic bag, right? So then when you get done with it, you, you clean up and you stuff everything in that little plastic bag and you stuff it down in that can. And then what do you think you're supposed to do next before you leave? You're supposed to put a new plastic bag in. And so if you forget that, the next person is not very happy with you because that makes quite a bit of mess. Uh, but uh, no, you do have privacy when you're, when you're in there going to the bathroom. Yes, sir. Can you walk when you get back from space? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it is challenging. It is hard to walk when you get back. So you've probably heard of, like sailors will talk about sea legs, right? Where when you, you've been out at sea and you've got the waves and you kind of get used to that rolling motion and then when you get back to earth, you still, or when you get back to land, you still kind of feel like you're, you've got that waves and that motion. So something similar happens when you get back to Earth as well. You've got this thing in your inner ear that helps you with your balance, and gravity affects that. So what we're feeling right now affects my inner ear, which affects my balance. And when I've been in space for six months, that gets all messed up. And so when I first get back, it's very difficult to stand and a lot of us uh, can have some problems with that. So it takes probably a couple weeks before you 
before you get back to where your inner ear is normal and you feel, you feel uh, like you're not going to fall over because that can happen. Um, and then the other thing that's kind of interesting when you first get back is you've forgotten how much things weigh. Uh, because for six months, everything weighed nothing. And so even this microphone, when I, when I first got back, uh, would have felt like it probably weighed 30 pounds or 40 pounds, even though it only weighs a couple of pounds, because your mind has kind of forgotten what it's like, what things weigh when you're up there. So there are some impacts when you first get back. Yes? Have we ever launched an animal up into space? Yes, we have. Another great. So... I mentioned that the International Space Station is a laboratory. And we oftentimes use animals to try out new things, to try and figure out what's happening to us when we're in outer space. So we have had things like uh, fish that have gone up into space. We've had spiders. When I was up there, we brought ants up on board. Now, the ants was more of a, just an experiment to see how they would behave. It was uh, actually kind of an education experiment. The little um, container that they came up in, kids around, uh, around the world, around the U.S., could have that same kind of container. And when we opened it up and took videos of how the ants behaved, the kids could be observing what they were doing in space and then seeing what they were doing down on Earth as well. Uh, we do take mice up as well. Uh, mice are, um, are used quite a bit in experiments, and so we do take uh, the mice up as well. And uh, so they get to experience microgravity. So yes, we have quite a few uh, animals that go up on the International Space Station. Let's go back over here. How easy is it to do a flip in space? It is very easy to do a flip in space. You had asked me about what it's like when I get back, right? So in space, one of the things that was, that was weird for me when I first got back was pitching motion. And so just a small motion like this. I would, when I first landed, I would lean over to wash my hands. And that small motion, I felt like I was just going to face plant right into the sink. Because up in space, if I had done that, I'd have done a flip. It's that easy to do a, a flip up in space. Uh, you can do flips, you can do twirls, you can... You can uh, snowboard. You can do all kinds of things up in, uh, in space. Yes. What was my role on board the International Space Station? Uh, so all of the astronauts that go up right now on board the International Space Station have to be able to do every job that we have on board. And so that means we have to be able to go out on a spacewalk. That means we have to operate that robotic arm. That means we have to be able to maintain the space station. So it actually takes quite a bit of maintenance on the, uh, to keep the International Space Station running. We have to be able to do the science. Now, that doesn't mean that we are the scientists. In fact, most of the experiments um, that we do on board the International Space Station have a, what we call a principal investigator on the ground. And we will work with that scientist on the ground to, to do the experiments. And they can involve us being the, the subjects, where we're the guinea pigs. They can involve ones where we're actually talking real time to a scientist as we're doing the experiment. And so we're kind of the hands, the eyes, the ears. And they're actually, um, and they're the smarts. And then there's the other ones where we'll set up an experiment. And while we're sleeping, a scientist on the ground will actually execute the experiment. And so we do science in a lot of different ways, but that's our primary mission on board the International Space Station, is, is that science. All right, let's go over here. Yes, ma'am. Does, does the moon have gravity on it? Does the moon have gravity on it, or does it not? It's a great question. The moon does have gravity. It just has a lot less gravity than, than we have here. So what we're feeling right now, we call 1G, one Earth's gravity. When you get to the moon, that's about a sixth, one-sixth of the gravity that we're feeling here. So what that means is if you go to the moon, you can jump really, really, really high. So there is gravity up there, but it's a, it's a lot less. Yes, sir. Yeah, brushing your teeth. I forgot to mention brushing your teeth. Uh, is it the same? No, it's a, it's a little bit different. So brushing your teeth in microgravity. Uh, again, you saw how water behaves so much differently. 
So in space, you have the same types of toothpaste and toothbrush, but what you end up doing is you'll just put a, one little drop of water on your toothbrush. And then you'll put some toothpaste on, but you don't want to use as much as you normally do down here on Earth because you don't have a sink to spit it in when you're up there. So you've got two options. <laughs> you can either swallow all of that foam that's in your mouth, all of that, or you can spit it out into a towel. And so that, for that reason, we tend to um, not use as much toothpaste when we're brushing our teeth. Uh, when I first got up there, I was uh, using the technique of, of swallowing the toothpaste. Uh, but after a while, I just ended up using a towel. You spit it in there, and then you hang the towel up, and eventually it dries up, right? And then that, that water has gone into the atmosphere up there, and then it comes out to this condensation. We recycle it, and we drink it again. It's just a vicious cycle. Yes, sir. Oh, what's the most fun thing to do on the international? There are so many things that are fun. Um, you know, up there, everything is, is a lot of fun. Um, you know, you can see what it's like to float. That looked pretty fun, right? I would say one of the, the most fun things I did was go out on spacewalks. In fact, I went out on two spacewalks. The first one was on the uh, 21st of December in 2013, and the other one was on Christmas Eve of uh, 2013. That is an incredible amount of fun, but it's also an incredible amount of work. Um, so that's one of those, you know, where you, you, you really enjoy it. It's, uh, it's a neat experience, but, um, but it's also very challenging as well. So I, I think just, man, that's what's the most fun. Every day was fun. Everything you did up there was, was fun. Uh, it was, my kids don't think I actually work anymore. They think I just... <laughs> I go to the playground every day now, and I think there's some, some truth to that. So, uh, yes, ma'am. How do I sleep in space? That's a great question, too. Uh, so we actually have a crew quarter in space. It's not very big. It's about the size of a little broom closet. And we sleep, uh, we have a sleeping bag. And so we actually have that strapped to a wall. You crawl into your sleeping bag, and, uh, and you go to sleep. Now, some of the astronauts like to sleep with their arms outside the sleeping bag. And so if you were to look into their crew quarters while they're sleeping, you're going to see their arms as they're sleeping. They're going to be floating out in front of them. Kind of weird to, to see that, uh, but it's pretty comfortable. Um, actually, for, for the older folks in the crowd, if any of you are like me, um, I've over the years started to have that lower back pain. Uh, things of that nature, and uh, for six months while I was in space, I had no back pain. It was amazing because you, you don't have that load of the gravity on you anymore, so it made it much better to sleep for me at night as well, and if any of you have back pain, I recommend going to space. That's, uh, that's a great way to get rid of it. Yes, ma'am. How do we cook food in space? Yeah, eating in space. Uh, well, you got to see some of the food that came up. And a lot of it is uh, you don't have to cook up there. So we have really two types of food. We have the uh, irradiated food, so it's already pre-cooked, and we've, we've zapped it to get rid of any germs or anything like that. And so on that food, all you have to do is just heat it up. And so we've got like this little oven that we can put these packets of food in to heat it up. The other type of food is dehydrated. And that one, you've got to add a little bit of water. And, and then you let it sit there for 10, 15, 20 minutes while the, the food soaks up that water, and then you can, you can eat it that way. And then some of the food is just like the food we have down here on Earth. So we'll have granola bars, and we'll have uh, beef jerky, and you saw those tortillas that came up and things of that nature. So the food up there now, the drinking, though, is a little bit harder, right? For those of you that like that cup of coffee or a cup of tea in the morning, well, you can't have that. It's not the same way. You have it in that, uh, if you remember when Karen was washing her hair, that bag. So we have bags like that that'll have um, like your instant coffee in it. And so you'll put hot water in it, and then you drink your coffee out of a straw. So that takes some, some getting used to for those of you that like a cup of coffee. So it's a little bit different, uh, but it works pretty well. Yes, sir. What does it taste like drinking pee? <laughs> Well, fortunately, fortunately, um, it tastes just like water because it's recycled, and so you don't notice that you're actually drinking pee. It's, it's just like you're drinking water. So uh, it doesn't taste quite the same. Yes, ma'am. 
What was the hardest thing to do? Um, the hardest thing to do, two things I'll say about that. Uh, that spacewalk that I talked about was definitely one of the, the hardest things to, to do, um, and yet one of the most rewarding. And then the other thing that I'll mention is being away from your family. Uh, there is no doubt that that is challenging. Um, I have uh, my wife and two sons, and uh, so basically I uh, was gone for seven months. Now I know there's a lot of folks in the military and business that are, are deployed and all of that as well and, and have to go through that, but it's still, uh, I, I find it very challenging uh, to be away from them for any length of time, and, and I would certainly say that was, uh, that was one of the things that was difficult, yeah, without a doubt. Yes, sir. When did I first get to space? Yeah, so I got to space. So I showed up at, to NASA in 2009. And when you show up to NASA as a new astronaut, you go through basic astronaut training. And that takes about two years. Uh, then I was very fortunate, and at the end of that basic astronaut training, I got assigned to a mission. And it was another two-year training program before I actually got to launch into space. So from the time I showed up to NASA as, a, as an astronaut to when I actually went into space uh, was a little over four years, and that was in September of 2013. I was very fortunate. I have classmates that showed up with me in 2009 that still haven't gone to space yet. So we have about, in the U.S., we have about 50 active astronauts, and we're only launching about four a year. Um, so it's pretty easy to do the math and realize that it's, uh, it can sometimes be a long wait. So I've already been back on Earth now for four years, and I'm still not reassigned for another mission. So at best case, I'm probably looking at maybe six years before, before I'd have a chance to fly again. Um, but that's the reality. I feel very blessed, very fortunate to, to have gotten to fly at least once into, into space. Yes? How many times? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. In the shuttle days, the space shuttle days, uh, they would go up for just a two-week type mission. And, um, and so they got the opportunities to fly multiple times into space. Some of the astronauts flew four or five, uh, some even six or seven times into space, but they would only go up for a very short mission, a couple weeks. I've actually only been up one time, but I went up for 166 days, so not quite six months. Um, so the, the missions are, are definitely a little bit different. Um, so even though I only flew once, I've, I've probably flown longer than some of those astronauts that flew multiple times on the, on the space shuttle. Yes, sir. Do I what? Do I use rocket boots in space? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't have rocket boots in space. Well, I do have something, though. When you go out on a spacewalk, we actually have a little jet pack that we take out with us. Now, the reason we have that jet pack is when we go out on a spacewalk, we have what we call a safety tether. And that safety tether is a, is a long reel. Um, it's a cable, basically. And the first thing you do when you come out of the hatch is you hook that up. And then as you're crawling around the space station, that reel is coming out behind you. Now, if at any point something should go wrong and that cable should break, and I should come off of the space station and start floating away, I've got that jet pack that I've got basically one chance to get back to the space station. And if you don't get there, well, then you're, you become a, your own little satellite orbiting, orbiting the Earth. Uh, so we do have a jet pack, but it's, uh, if I ever have to use that, that's going to be a very, very bad day. So hopefully I'll never have the opportunity to use that. Okay, we're going to take one more question, and then uh, I'll leave you with a final thought, and then uh, I think it'll probably be time for lunch. Yes, sir. Do I read Ice Cream in Space? Um, I have not read Ice Cream uh, in Space in Space. Um, I, did, I did actually, there was a program, uh, I can't remember, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the books about Max, the, uh, the dog who goes to space. I actually ended up reading those. We took videos of them, and uh, and then uh, they were they were shared with people, and they could uh, you know they could read the book to their to their child, um, and watch the video of me reading the book in the cupola, looking out at at space going by as well. So I did have an opportunity to uh, to do some reading, but not that particular. I'll I'll also mention I don't know if uh, if any of you remember. I oftentimes also get asked about movies. And, and have you seen any, what movies, and things of that nature. And so, um, I don't know if you remember the movie Gravity. 
Yeah, you remember the, the disasters that kind of kept happening and happening. I actually watched gravity when I was in space. <laughs> but uh, fortunately, um, fortunately, you, you, uh, nothing like that happened to us. Okay. That's, uh, I think we'll wind it there from questions. Um, and I do want to leave the, uh, the kids with just one final thought, one idea, if you will. Um, so as was mentioned in the introduction, um, I, I converted to Catholicism uh, in 2012. And I had that opportunity to take the Eucharist, the body of Christ, up with me into space. And that was um, extremely, extremely important and meaningful to me. Um, but where I'm going with this story is my religious beliefs and faith has always been something that um, I've kept kind of close hold. It's been, been something very private uh, for me. And, um, but you just never know, right? I talked about when I was growing up, I had the goal of being a truck driver. And then somewhere along the way, I decided that uh, I wanted to get into the military and go into space. And so what I mean by all of that is God has a plan for you. And you don't know necessarily right now what that plan is. I love that suit, by the way. You don't know what that plan is. Um, I never envisioned that someday I would be in New Zealand at a Eucharist convention talking about the body of Christ. This is, quite frankly, more challenging to me than going out on that spacewalk and doing work like that. Sharing my faith and, and opening up you, uh, you definitely feel, for me anyway, a little bit vulnerable. And so, um, for the kids, God has a plan for you. And, uh, and I think it's going to be fantastic to, for, for your parents and all your friends to be able to watch as you grow up what that plan is. Enjoy, enjoy the ride as you go. Thank you all very much. All right, I'm not sure what's supposed to happen now. There we go. Stick around and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. We're actually going to lunch. Excellent. Uh, unless you have some more to do with the children, have you? Uh, you know, actually, is it possible for me to get in the middle of the kids and we take a, a group picture with all of the kids? Absolutely. I would, I would love to Absolutely. be able to do that, yes. if that's yeah. okay. So I tell you what, kids, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of jump right in the middle. And if you guys want to, actually, should we face, yeah. Yeah, I'll jump right in the middle, and, and you guys just squeeze in here, and we're going to take a picture together. Any other kids want to come up? Small kids. The magic of cell phones. Isn't it amazing? Send that one back to NASA, John. As many as those of you can get. Okay, you guys, we're going to do crazy faces too. You guys want to do that? You guys got your craziest face? All right, crazy face, ready? Crazy one, face. two, three. Am I the only one doing a crazy face? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, actually, I, I forgot one thing. Um, if everybody, is everybody good with the pictures? Are we good? Okay. Um, before, you, before the kids get up and leave, you guys stay right where you are. Don't step on you. Okay. I do have um, something for you. So if you notice on my, on my uh, flight suit here, I've got a couple of patches. And what these patches uh, symbolize are the missions that I was on. So remember when I first got up there, I talked about there were three astronauts already on board. And so I started as part of Expedition 37. And then when those three went home and the three new ones came up, we became Expedition 38. And so what I've got for you are uh, stickers of the Expedition 37 patch. If you guys uh, would like one, I'll, I'll be happy to pass those out to you. Okay? Wonderful. So thank you for coming out. Thanks for sharing your afternoon with us. I know it's a glorious day outside, and, and you're probably wanting to be playing somewhere. But uh, anyway, 
Let me share these with you guys, and again, thank you for coming. So we, re we resume at about 1.30.